That on? Okay. <laughs> Looks like the coronavirus has got us this morning, don't it? That's what I'm going to speak about this morning, the coronavirus. I figured it was something that uh, all of us might need to hear and apply to our lives and, and maybe see some biblical examples of plagues that affected this world. And yet in the midst of all of those plagues, God was still there and He's still here, amen? He's still here. In 1 Kings chapter 19, beginning in verse 1, we read a story about a famous character in the Bible named Elisha. And uh, we, we know, uh, remember those stories about Elisha and uh, the strength that he had to stand for God and, and proclaim the message of God no matter what was going on around him, no matter uh, how many folks were threatening him. He was still willing to stand and proclaim God. And this 19th chapter of 1 Kings gives us a picture, I think, that reminds us of where we might be at some point or some time in our life. If you're not there yet, you will be. 1 Kings chapter 19, beginning in verse 1. Ahab told Jezebel everything that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. And so Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, May the gods punish me and do so severely if I don't make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. And then Elijah became afraid and immediately he ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba, that belonged to Judah, he left his servant there. But he went on a day's journey into the wilderness, and he sat down under a broom tree, and he prayed that he might die. He said, I have had enough. Lord, take my life, for I'm no better than my father's. And then he lay down and he slept under the broom tree. And suddenly an angel touched him. And the angel told him, get up and eat. And then he looked, and there at, the head, at his head was a loaf of bread baked over hot coals and a jug of water. And so he ate and drank, and he lay down again. And then the angel of the Lord returned for a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat, or the journey will be too much for you. And so he got up and ate and he drank. And then on the strength from that food, he walked 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. He entered a cave there and spent the night. And then the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, but the Israelites have abandoned your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are looking for me to take my life. And then he said, go out and stand on the mountain of the Lord in the Lord's presence. And at that moment, the Lord passed by, and a great and a mighty wind was tearing at the mountains and was shattering cliffs before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a voice, a soft whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle, and he went out and he stood at the entrance of the cave. And suddenly a voice came to him, and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, but the Israelites have abandoned your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, 
and they looked for me to take my life. And then the Lord said to him, Go and return the way you came to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you are to anoint Haziel as king over Aram. You are to anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, and Elisha, son of Zaphat, from the Abel Mahola, as prophet in your place. Then Jehu will put to dream, put to dream, whoever, put to death, whoever escapes the sword of Hazael. And Elisha will put to death whoever escapes the sword of Jehu. But I will leave 7,000 in Israel, every knee that has bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. Father, we pray that you would just speak to us this morning. Lord, I pray that I'll be able to share something that's going on in each of our lives, and in our community, and in our state, and in our world. Lord, that, that we need more than anything else is you. We need you to walk with us as we go through all these things that we're experiencing. As we watch TV and we hear about uh, friends and families and, 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 and others around us who are suffering through this pandemic that's going on now. Lord, one thing I want more than anything else is I want to be faithful to you. And I pray that you'll give every one of us the trust we need, no matter what the next step brings. Speak to us this morning, Father. For it's in Jesus' precious name I pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I guess many of you are like I have been. I've had the coronavirus blues. Se segregated from everybody that you're accustomed to being around. And one of the things that, that uh, breaks my heart is that our church family has gradually over the months shrunk. Now I know it's because of all the stuff that's going on. Uh, it's scary to leave your house and know that whoever you get around might be someone that's carrying something they don't even know about. Because if they knew about it, they wouldn't get around you. But it is that deceptive. And it is that one thing that causes us fear. And I've been missing our church family. It's been getting me down, and I'm sure it's got many people down. As I was sitting there at first this week thinking about what I'd share with this morning, I began praying and, and seeking God, asking Him, what could I share today that would be relevant for what's going on, that uh, hopefully, prayerfully, would speak to someone's heart, about how serious all this stuff is. It's not a game. It's real. And we got to be prepared for what's real. Amen? You know, you can, you can play hide and go seek like kids if you want to. <laughs> but that's just a game. And what we're going through in this day and time, not only here at Mount Zion, not only here at Chula, not only here in South Georgia, but all over this world is not a game. It is something that is deadly serious. And we got to be aware of it and we got to do what needs to be done to preserve life, to save life, to foster life. And as I was praying about all that, God told me, he really spoke to me. And he said, you can't do all that 
by yourself. You can't do everything, no matter how much you want to. We can't do all of it as a church, no matter how much we might want to. But he told me, he said, but you can do one thing that you can do and you can be sure of doing. And I'm here to tell you this morning, you can do one thing that you can be sure of doing. You know what it is? We can be faithful. Faithful. Faithful means you trust, right? Faithful means you, you, you depend. You know it's going to be there. You know it's something that, that's uh, not going to be taken away from you. We can be faithful. And I got thinking about that and I wrote down three things. I think we can be faithful to do as born again believers. First off, we can pray. I know some people that uh, they don't want to pray in public, but some of those that I've heard tell me don't ask me to pray in the church when I was pastor here. I've heard them pray though. But they just can't do it with other folks around listening. But everybody can pray. No matter what kind of inferiority complex you might have, no matter what kind of inhibitions you might uh, display in your life, you can pray. And when you pray, you're trusting God. You're leaning on God. You're looking for answers and and so we need to do more praying than what we're doing. It's good for us. If it's not good for anybody else, it's good for us. Amen. And then we need to read the scriptures. And as we read the scriptures, we need to look at the promises. The promises that are reserved for us. That we know is going to be there. And then we need to walk. That's physical exercise. That's that spiritual walk as well. We need to walk. In Romans 15, 4, it says, Everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that the endurance taught in the Scriptures and encouragement they provide might have hope. And so if we want to be encouraged, I want you to have endurance for the race because we're not done. We haven't reached the finish line yet. You need to read the scriptures. You need to depend upon what they have to say to you. And that's especially important as we're quarantined at home and separated from everybody else and having to wear a mask. We need to trust and get closer to the Father and then share that trust and that closeness with others around us. Not for show, but because we're faithful because we love our church family. We love our immediate family. We love our neighbors. We love our friends. There was a TV show had a guest to appear on it. It was a bodybuilder. As he entered the stage, his huge, muscular body just flexed over and over again. You've seen him do that, you know. I, I stood in the mirror this week looking to see if I could do it, and I couldn't. It still remained flabby. It didn't do any tightening up enough for me to even see it. But he had the muscles. 
he could blink his eyes and a muscle on his arm would just pop up. He could turn a little bit and, and you could see the muscles across his abdomen just make those ripples. And every time he'd do that, the crowd would just cheer. They would just go nuts over it. He'd just do it even more than he had been doing it. After he did that, standing up and flexing all those muscles for about three times, someone asked him a question. He says, what do you do with all those muscles? And the bodybuilder just looked at him. And the guy asked him again, what do you do with all of those muscles? And he had no answer. You see, he was a man with all power, but his power had no purpose other than just to show off and bring attention to himself. I read in the Christian Index a couple of weeks ago where it said 10% of people believe they're better off dead than alive. 10%. It said one in four people said that they were unhappy in their jobs, while one in three felt exhausted, unappreciated, and underpaid. And if we took a survey here, I think we'd probably find something pretty close to that with each of us. A lady by the name of Christine Weber the psychotherapist. She did a survey and she said this, sadly it comes as no surprise to me that so many people are unhappy at home and at work. It seems that people's lives don't live up to their extremely high expectations. It is particularly worrying to see so many people dwelling on morbid thoughts with a large portion just plainly exhausted by life. That's probably true for a lot of us. We're wore out with this. You can't go out and eat anymore. All you can do is go through the drive-thru. You go to the grocery store, Dorothy and I, we get up at 6.30 in the morning and go to Walmart. And they got signs everywhere, and some dodo will come walking backwards on that aisle every time. Coming right at you. You see, a lot of people are wondering what life is all about right now. We've gone into this forced seclusion by the government, and they're still arguing. If you watch Fox News, you'll see that, you know, they're still arguing about what, what we're supposed to do and uh, what will protect us the best. Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, wondered about the meaning of life. And he started out of the book of Ecclesiastes and he said about life. You know what he said? Meaningless. Meaningless. Utter meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Now, I believe he was wrong. Otherwise, I wouldn't be up here standing in front of you today. I believe you think he's wrong. Otherwise, you wouldn't be out here to worship and praise the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But let me just share a few things with you today that might make your life a little more meaningful over these days and months to come. In fact, I believe that these things I'm going to share with you are the, really the meaning of what we live for. 
And if we neglect them, then we're going to end up being empty. We're going to lose touch with all those around us, and those that we love. We're not going to be able to be an encouragement to someone else or let them be an encouragement to us. We're going to be right by our self in a world that's filled with people. And if we do these things that I got marked down, life will be fulfilling. Life will be happy. And life will have a purpose. Don't you think we all need that right now? Somebody say amen. amen. All right, I got it. I learned a long time ago, if you don't say amen, you can always get it by asking for it. First thing we have to do in our life, if we're going to have meaning, is to discover God and grow in our relationship with Him. Some of you went through the study we had here at Mount Zion several years ago, The Purpose Driven Church. Rick Warren wrote that book and, and that study. And in it, he said, genuine spiritual maturity includes having a heart that worships and praises God. Genuine spiritual maturity includes having a heart that worships and praises God. When Jesus was asked a question about what the greatest commandment in all the scripture was, he quoted Deuteronomy 6, 5. And he said, you must love the Lord God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. See, that's what we were created to do, to love God. And no matter how successful a person might be in life, that person could have all the fame and fortune that the world could offer. We could even have the, the money that Bill Gates has got, or the political power of the President of the United States, or some of these politicians that we see on TV day in and day out, and every one of them's got the best idea according to them. But if we don't have a loving relationship with Jesus, our life will end up being empty and useless and unfulfilled. And we'll try to replace that emptiness with some kind of pleasure that we think will give us joy and will give us happiness. But none of those things will replace that relationship we have with God. After finding out that everything that a person could have didn't work, Solomon found out his wisdom, his expertise, his wealth, all those 900 and something wives that he had, the vast army that was there with him. You'd have thought he had it all. But he came to the conclusion I don't have anything. And you know what he didn't, why he didn't have anything? Because he didn't have happiness. He didn't have joy. He didn't have that attitude of looking for the great grand things God was about to do in his life. You see, we were created for a purpose. And that was to have a relationship, one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. And if we remove that element from our life, 
will always end up being empty and powerless and purposeless. And so the first thing, if we want to have joy, real joy, we need to find real fulfillment in life. And that only happens when we discover Jesus and we walk with Him every day. But the good news is, even in a pandemic, He's not far off. Amen? In fact, listen to what He said. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I overcame and sat down with my Father on His throne. Even in the midst of all that we're going through, maybe we hadn't suffered the loss of a loved one. Maybe we hadn't suffered going through what that virus can cause when it comes upon us. we can understand that when we invite Him in our lives, after we've heard Him say, open your heart's door, I will come in. He will come again. He will come in. And He rules and reigns. He rules and reigns. And He wants us to be able to rule and reign with Him. We're a king's kid. You think of when they show Queen Elizabeth, and, you know, and she's a queen, and I know, but, but all those kings, she's got a lot of children underneath her. And Charles one day is going to be king of England. He's going to have probably the second most powerful position in the world. He's going to be the king of England. And you and I have been promised that we're kings and princesses. Princes and princesses in this life. And Jesus is always with us walking beside us. The second thing necessary for us to find real meaningless in life is to build and enjoy loving relationship with others. You know, you have that relationship with Jesus and it changes what you think about friends, what you think about family, what you think about church, when you find Jesus, it changes your whole attitude to relationships. Because He comes in as one that will never let you down. He comes into your life as one you know you can always depend upon. He's going to be there. It might not be on your timing, but He'll never be late. Amen? He'll never be late. And He wants us to think about that relationship we have with Him and form that relationship with others. And it's hard to do that this day and time. When you can't see anybody, when you can't get around anybody, it's tough to build those relationships. And no man is an island. You're not on your own. I thought one time in my life, I didn't need anybody. I thought the people just hurt you. And sometimes, and oftentimes, they do hurt you. Because all of us are flawed. All of us are so messed up somewhere. And we're so ignorant and so selfishness that Selfishness just rules and reigns in our life. And we do hurt each other. We say and we do the wrong thing. 
even if we got the best intentions about what we're doing. But I've come to the realization that relationships are worth the cost. That it's more than just shaking a hand with someone. It's more than just nodding your head when you pass them in the road. Relationships are those, those relations that you have with others that never get spoiled because there is trust, there is reliance, there is a need for that other person in your life. We were created to love. Jesus said the second most important thing God requires of you is first being in love with Him and the second is to love others as yourself. And I wonder sometimes how much do we really love others? As much as we love ourselves or do we love others just enough to get what we want? Jesus even went to the point of saying that we have to love others just as much as He loved others. And that's difficult. That's hard. Life gets hard. It gets troubled. And that causes us to have even, even greater depression But whenever you turn to God, the very first thing He begins to teach you is to love others. When we come to God, He always directs us in certain directions. And one of them is into a church family. Because we need to learn to love others. And the easiest place to learn to love others is fellow church members, fellow believers in Christ, those who know the Lord, who love the Lord, and who demonstrate that everywhere they go. A lot of people don't know how to forgive. They don't know how to be kind. They don't know how to be loving. And I've come to the conclusion that the reason that's so is because the number one in their life is them. It's not God. It's not Jesus. It's them. A lot of people won't come to church. We got a community around here. There's just all kind of folks right around us that we know don't go to church anywhere. They don't have a family, a church family, to lean on, to rely on, to trust that whatever they're going through, they won't have to go through it by themselves. And it's left up to us to show them Yes, we know we're not perfect people. We mess up. We goof up. But there's one thing we can always do. From the bottom of our heart, we can say, I'm sorry. I'll do better next time. And that's what a real friend does. One of the dangers of a, a big church is that you lose your identity when you go in. When you're sitting there with just multitudes and multitudes of folks that you don't know their name, 
You know, you come to Mount Zion Baptist Church, especially like this morning, everyone else is here, we know each other's names, don't we? But the truth of the matter is we know everybody's name in Mount Zion. And we look at these empty chairs and we say, I wonder how they're doing. How's Bob doing? How's Sue doing? How's Joe doing? And just ask those questions. And as we ask those questions, you know why we're asking them? God is leading us to do something about those we don't see. Call. Wear a mask and go visit them. Talk to them. Let them know that they are cared for. I got a call yesterday. Dennis Greer, who it was, called me. And you know, with their health and everything, it's dangerous for them to be out and going around. He called and he said, I just wanted to touch base with you and let you know I was praying for you. That I love you. He can't get out of his house, but he knows how to minister from his house. How often do we forget to do that? The only way to find fulfillment in life is to learn to love others and to learn to enjoy each other. And the third thing necessary in having a fulfilled life is to use our gifts and talents in service to others. Again, that's pretty hard to do when you're confined to your home. God's Word says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 5 and 7, there are different kinds of service in the church, but it is the same Lord we are serving. There are different ways God works in our lives, but it's the same God who does the work through all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us as a means of helping the entire church. Think about what that scripture said. It said every one of us has a spiritual gift to be used of God. A gift in the church to reach in the church and outside the church into a world around us. I didn't understand that when I first came to the Lord. But there was a man around me named Randall Glover that could show more love and more compassion than anybody I ever met. He took me under his wing we went out visiting together. I joined the Gideons. He was already in the Gideons. And we traveled all of South Georgia sharing the Gideon message of how those Bibles touch lives and how people like us in the church can extend our ministry outside of our church to people we would never even see by providing the funds to give those Bibles away. And the Gideons are, are doing it. I went to Reedsville State Prison. I didn't, wasn't charged with anything, okay? But I went to Reedsville State Prison. And we went through those big old iron doors with barbed wire all around. Uh, a fence inside the doors. You talking about a scary feeling is walking through all of that knowing you're inside where they're at. And then we walked up and down those jail cells. And we witnessed and we passed out Bibles. I don't know how many lives were touched. But I know all that that we did 
did not go in vain. God's Word goes forth, it touches hearts. Amen. God's Word goes forth, it fosters faith. God's Word goes forth, it gives us strength to get through whatever we might be facing. Ephesians chapter 4 says, Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do His work and build up the church, the body of Christ, until we come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature and full grown in the Lord, measuring up to the full stature in Christ. Your job and my job is to help all of us grow up spiritually and be what Christ wants from us. And the last point I want to make is similar to serving, but not quite the same. If you want the real meaning and purpose of life, you must be sharing your faith with lost people. Boy, Harold passed away not long ago. There was someone that lived close to him that he was concerned about. It seemed like forever. He introduced that person to me. And Foy had already witnessed to him. But he told me he wanted me to go witness to him as well. And so he took me. And I witnessed. And they didn't make any kind of response. When Aaron came... months ago one of the first places he went guess what it was boy Harold said I need you to go with me to witness to someone boy never gave up he took Aaron Aaron witnessed to the man the man didn't make any kind of commitment but he heard that witness again. If Foy was still alive, his heart would still have that person pricking at his heart, causing him to pray and ask God to bring salvation to him through whatever means God chose and whatever person God chose. And you know that's the call that every one of us has. We don't just go through the motions, sing the hymns, pray the prayers, shake the hands, go home and eat Sunday dinner. We don't just go through the motions. It's all about us serving. It's all about us loving. It's all about us caring. It's all about us leading someone to Jesus. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And we got to quit ducking that. Because guess what else he said? Lo, that don't mean it's low. That means give me your attention. I will be with you 
even to the ends of this earth. And that's our call. More today than any other time. We need to be praying for those around us. We need to be praying for our pastor and his wife as they go through this coronavirus. We need to be praying for people we don't even know. Maybe they don't know Jesus, but if they see the church living the walk that Jesus called us to walk, and touching lives, touching hearts will make a difference. Will make a difference. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you will speak to us in whatever way we need to hear today. That you'll give us a, a heart that loves you and loves those around us. Lord, may we be encouraged as we leave this place today knowing that we are guaranteed we won't be walking by ourselves. You'll be walking with us. And if there is anyone here today that needs to renew that relationship with you or begin that relationship with you. I pray that you will speak to their hearts today. For it's in Christ's name we pray. And all God's people said,